All right. Well, tonight we're going to uh, study Saint or look at the life of Saint Sebastian of Jackson, or sometimes referred to as Sebastian of San Francisco and Jackson. Saint Sebastian is a man of firsts. He was the first American-born man ordained a priest. If we don't include. Alaska-born clergy, because it wasn't a part of the states, um, at least at the time when St. Sebastian was first born. Um, he was the first American-born man tonsured a monk, and he was the first American-born man glorified as a saint. So we've looked at, and will look at, you know, these American saints. He is the only one of them who was actually born on our own land. He didn't come from some other land, but he was born here. And we've, uh, as I've done in the past classes, I've divided his life up into different sections. St. Sebastian will look at his early life until his tonsure, his preparation and beginning of his ministry, his ministry under St. Tikon, what I call turbulent times, and then his final years. So let's begin. St. Sebastian was born on the 21st of June, 1863, to the first recorded Serbian immigrants on the west coast of the United States. He was the fourth of seven children to be born to his parents. And at the time of his birth, he was given the name John. So like I've known in the past lectures, I'll refer to him by his uh, birth name until his name gets changed. So, or Jovan, really, but John. During this time when he was born, there was no official church in this San Francisco. Um... But there had been formed at that time the Greek, Russian, Slavonian, Eastern Church and Benevolent Society, which consisted of all the Orthodox ethnicities in San Francisco, the Russians, Serbs, Greeks, Syrians. And while they didn't have church services, they did gather on feast days and they sang you know, various religious songs, but also folk songs for the feasts. So they still celebrated in the way they could, um, but, you know, not in its fullness with divine services. <clears throat> Rather, since there was no church and there were no priests, um, the community up there in San Francisco was served by Russian Orthodox priests, chaplains, who came through San Francisco with the Russian Imperial Navy whenever they were docked in port. Um, and this is how John was baptized. He was taken onto the ship because there's a chapel on the ship and he was baptized there on the ship. Kind of a crazy idea thinking of having Russian Navy docked in our ports nowadays, but, you know, things weren't uh, as crazier as they are now. <laughs> but this is how the, uh, the Orthodox community in San Francisco was served for um, you know these early years um, by priests coming through with the Navy, cha the chaplains coming through with the Navy, mm -hmm. and they would go onto the ship for the, uh, for the liturgy, for, you know, for all these sacraments that they were missing out on. In 1868, a year after the purchase of Alaska, a Russian priest from Alaska was finally assigned to serve the Orthodox community in San Francisco. The Dabovich family, St. Sebastian's family name is Dabovich, this family regularly attended the services that were held in another Serb's house. And John and his mother attended the first liturgy held on land in the new, at the new chapel as opposed to being held as it usually was at the, on the Russian, you know, uh, naval ships. 
As a child, John was serious, quiet, frail, but pious. And his passion for mission work was first learned from Bishop John of the Russian Church, who was transferred, who transferred his see from Sitka to San Francisco in 1872. So he was the bishop of Alaska and had his the seat of his diocese in Sitka, as we saw, you know, um, from St. Innocent. And, but then he transferred it to San Francisco as, you know, things expanded on the West Coast. John could be found in church whenever there was a service. And even from his childhood, he always intended to become a priest. There was no other path for him. As he grew up, he was known for his selflessness and abstinence. He would eat and dress very modestly. He, uh, all his food was very simple. He didn't really care about you know, material things. And he was often on the lookout for those in need, assisting them however he could, often giving away his own possessions of which he did not have many. After he graduated from high school in 1881, John served as a reader and chanter in the St. Alexander Nevsky Cathedral in San Francisco. And three years later, in 1884, he moved to Sitka to work at the St. Michael Cathedral to do the same things, serving as reader and chanter. But also, at Sitka, he also worked as an assistant um, the cathedral and catechist. And he taught many of the families that were originally evangelized by St. Innocent. So, you know, there's a few generations afterwards. Um, and so he's teaching those children who were originally taught by St. Innocent. John even followed in St. Innocent's own footsteps, evangelizing a tribe of Tlingits in Juneau, Remember, um, St. Innocent had evangelized many of the Tlingits um, in the Sitka area, and they had converted to Christianity. But there was this other tribe near Juneau, um, which was then a very small town, um, that had not converted to Christianity. They hadn't heard the gospel. And John, at this time, followed in St. Innocent's footsteps and... Um, put together a group of people, of Tlingits from Sitka to be translators and to help preach the gospel in Juneau. Um, and in 1893, uh, the first church in Juneau was built, which is the oldest continually functioning church in Alaska. But due to the harsh climate, John's health suffered greatly in Alaska, and he returned to San Francisco at the end of 1887. When his health was fully recovered seven months later, in July, he was assigned as a teacher of the cathedral school in 1888. And on December 18, 1888, John was tonsured into monasticism <laughs> and given the name of Sebastian, because that's the day the feast um, the saint that was celebrated that day. He was celebrated when we celebrate St. Sebastian, December 18th. And then one week after his tonsure, he was ordained to the diaconate. And so from here in his life, we see a lot of the preparation for ministry and also the beginning of his ministry. Two years later, after he was ordained, in 1890, Father Sebastian's bishop, Bishop Vladimir, who we'll hear more about in the class on St. Alexis Toth, mm -hmm. sent him to the Theological Academy in St. Petersburg. I didn't want to say too much about Bishop Vladimir, but he is a very exceptional character himself, very missionary-minded, um, who also helped inspire Father Sebastian um, to even more so in his, you know, uh, missionary mindedness. Um, 
While Father Sebastian was in St. Petersburg, he not only was learning in the classes, but more importantly, he was learning from one of the greatest Russian hierarchs of the day, Metropolitan Isidore of Novgorod, St. Petersburg, and Finland, who was himself also another missionary-minded priest or bishop. But just like in Alaska, the climate caused Father Sebastian to suffer health problems, and he was then sent to the Theological Academy of Kiev in 1891. After finishing studies, he returned to the United States in 1892, and on, the August, and on August 16th, 1892, he was ordained to the priesthood. But even before he was ordained to the priesthood, he had submitted a report to his bishop that estimated that there were around 1,500 Orthodox Christians along the entire western coast of the United States. These were Orthodox Christians who had no contact with a priest, a church, because there was nothing really. Um, and he requested to be a missionary priest to minister to these lost sheep. And so within a week after he was given permission to do so, within a week after his ordination, he set out on his first missionary journey that would take him as far north as Vancouver and as far south as San Diego covering over 3,000 miles of travel, visiting various uh, locations like Portland, Seattle, obviously Vancouver, San Diego, um, Fresno, you know, Los Angeles. You know, during his, this journey, he found Christians, Orthodox Christians, who had been deprived of any contact from the church, as well as a number of uniots, you know, those people who... Um, had at some point been Orthodox, but and then been united to the Roman Church, um, become uh, part of the Roman Church, but they look and sound and act just like us. Um, they're called uniots. And he would help reconcile not only the uniots, but also the people who had not been to church in years, back to the church, you know, through um, confessing them and baptizing their kids and marrying them and these kinds of things, um, you know, serving the mysteries as he could um, wherever he found people. During this trip, he founded uh, an initial chapel in Portland and Seattle. He was not uh, too impressed or too hopeful that Portland was the right place for a chapel for, because there wasn't a lot of Orthodox Christians in the area. They were more spread out, but he was very um, hopeful for Seattle because there were lots there who thought they could be um, a thriving community if it was organized. But due to the tremendous missionary activity of Father Alexis Toth, the future saint, in bringing back the Uniots, um, into communion with the church. We'll hear a lot about that in a few weeks' time. Father Sebastian was sent to minister at the St. Mary Church in Minneapolis following Father Alexis's return to Pennsylvania. So Father Alexis had um, been traveling, he's originally in Pennsylvania, been traveling kind of like in that area, um, through that area, helping reconcile the Uniots and bringing them back into the church. And um, one of the communities, St. Mary in Minneapolis, there was a very large number of people, but he couldn't stay. He had to go back to Pennsylvania, so he requested um, the bishop in San Francisco to send him a priest to help him to serve that community, and Father Sebastian was chosen. But he was only there for less than a year. But he, during that time, he still made a profound impact on the community in the way he conducts himself as a priest, monk, and catechist. There was a nice little uh, remembrance of his time there in this book, um, which I used for the majority of uh, his life. Um, of uh, I think it was the choir director there at St. Mary talking about how Father Sebastian, you know, was as a person, as a man, as a priest during his time there. But while serving St. Mary, he was also able to visit and minister to the Orthodox Christians in Chicago, 
um, and starting to begin to organize them into a you know real community. And in May of 1893, Father Sebastian was awarded the Gold Cross after less than a year as a priest due to his tireless missionary efforts. So in the Russian church especially, there are um, awards given to priests, um, depending on various things, you know, the um, different hats you can wear, different colored hats you can wear, different crosses you can wear. Um, you know, every priest of the Russian tradition, when they're ordained or given a cross, a silver cross, um, it's not, doesn't happen in you know, the Greek tradition. But uh, so they already have a silver cross. So then the next step is the gold cross. And then they can wear a jeweled cross. That would be the next award. Um, you know, in our tradition, whenever you are given one of these awards or elevated, the priest is to be an archpriest or a proto-presbyter. Um, you can just wear any kind of cross. Um, but the Russians have a much more detailed system. But uh, in either way... The award is normally only given you know, after 10 years of service as a priest. Um, and he got it in less than a year as a priest. That's how um, highly he was thought of by his bishop and the people that he served. In 1894, he visited Jackson, California to baptize a Serbian infant there. And he found that there was a large Serbian population there who worked in the gold mines. And due to this large presence of uh, Orthodox Serbs, he saw and felt that it was necessary to build a church there in Jackson. And the people were able to pool their resources together, and the community was able to purchase land um, that would house a church and a cemetery. And by the end of 1894, the church temple was completed. It was consecrated on December 16th under the patronage of St. Sava of Serbia. Excuse me. The bishop at the time, Nicholas, donated bells, uh, a chandelier, and an icon of the Mother of God, which had been painted at St. Pathalaman Monastery on Mount Athos. And later, the same icon would be revealed as wonderworking um, uh, with various miracles, and it became known as the Jackson icon of the Mother of God. I don't know any of the miracles, so don't ask me. But it'd be interesting to look into. into. Though using San Francisco as his base of operations, since he was assigned as the priest of the cathedral there, he still continued his missionary journeys throughout the West Coast and went to Jackson um, to serve the community there. He laid the foundation um, for founding, or founded himself, Parishes in Oregon, Washington, California, Arizona, and Montana. Among uh, that's is on the West Coast. There were other churches that he had hand in later in his life that were other places, but that's just on the West Coast. Now we're going to look a little bit at his life um, under Saint Tikon, who another saint we'll look at later in the series. It's where you. Uh, a theme we keep seeing in all these saints' lives, how interconnected they are. And this isn't the last saint we'll be hearing about in this lecture that we'll also be looking at in another lecture. Um, a lot of these early figures in Orthodoxy in America were very intertwined, or at least came across paths at some point. In 1898, Bishop Tikhon, the future patriarch of Moscow and saint, arrived at his new assignment to the American Diocese. He was met at the San Francisco Cathedral by Father Sebastian and John Shami, or Shami, a Syrian priest from Galveston. <coughs> so he was from Galveston. He traveled to San Francisco to meet the new bishop. Noticed how the Serbian and Syrian priests went to meet their new bishop, who was a Russian bishop, you know, 
early in our history in this country, um, we didn't have the same jurisdictional lines, you know. Um, and everyone was under the Russian church because they were the first to this land. Um, so they kind of set up shop and it was, everything ran well. And under St. Deacon, um, his vision, I think, for the country, it would have been, uh, you know, a lot better than what we have nowadays. Even, um, And we'll hear a little bit more about it. But, uh, you know, so nowadays we have a very kind of divided, in a in certain sense, um, churches. You know, obviously we're united in faith and our sacraments, but we're very divided, you know, uh, administratively and, you know, canonically. And, but this wasn't always so. And Father Sebastian's reputation as a great missionary was not only known locally here in the United States, but also throughout the world at this time. He had received awards from Tsar Nicholas II, Prince Nicholas of Montenegro, the King of Serbia, and the Patriarch of Jerusalem. During this time, he was in the process of a new missionary effort of translation and writing. So he completed one of the first English translations of the Divine Liturgy, and he wrote three English language books. Remember, English was his first language. Even though he knew Serbian, he knew Russian, and to a lesser extent Greek, English was his first language. He was completely fluent, um, which made him a very uh, you know, useful tool for um, catechism Chism and evangelization in, you know, an English-speaking country. So besides the translation of the Divine Liturgy, he also wrote three English-language books. The first is called The Holy Orthodox Church, The Rituals, Services, and Sacraments of the Eastern Apostolic Church. The second is The Lives of the Saints and Several Lectures and Sermons. And the third, Preaching in the, Orthodox, or, preaching in the Russian Church, Lectures and sermons by a priest of the Holy Orthodox Church. If you go on Orthodox Wiki, I believe they have links to these. I mean, they're scanned, and so um, you can, I don't know if you can find them in a physical copy anymore, but at least you can find them in a digital copy if, uh, if you go to um, St. Sebastian's Orthodox Wiki page. It'll have, uh, should have links to each of those books if you're interested in looking more into them. Father Sebastian, with his work intended for these books to uh, help further educate second and third generation um, American-born Orthodox, um, but also to be to aid in catechizing the non-Orthodox. And he was keenly aware that for Orthodoxy to grow in the U.S., it had to be presented and experienced in the native English language. So before um, Bishop Tikon come, the bishop, uh, what do you say, his name was Nicholas, um, or was it, they might have both, it was either Vladimir or Nicholas, one of the bishops that preceded St. Tikon, um, they would also um, serve some in English as well, um, so... <laughs> You know, it's kind of, things have kind of switched from early American Orthodoxy to where we are nowadays, where um, some of these early, you know, uh, cradle, you know, uh, ethnic bishops were actually endeavoring to serve in the local language, whereas we see kind of like the flip nowadays, where we see more of the, you know, kind of ethnic language being used, whether it be, you know, Greek or... Um, Slavonic or Ukrainian or whatever it is. Um, so we've had a little bit of a flip. During this time also, even though nothing really came to fruition from this, but Father Sebastian made efforts to teach the Episcopalians about orthodoxy. <coughs> um, he befriended an Episcopalian bishop, Charles Grafton, um, and he was uh, instrumental 
um, in spreading orthodoxy um, among the Episcopal Church in the United States and educating them more about it. Um, and though it might not might seem crazy to us now, but at the time they were considered the um, they were seen to be hold the closest theology um, to the Orthodox Church out of all the uh, you know Protestant um, denominations in the United States. We kind of have a hard time grasping that now with what we see, but that's how it used to be. Um, so that's why he, he tried to make inroads there. You know, during this um, these discussions, and he even they even organized a conference at one point. Um, he was always loving, but firm. He uh, was sympathetic, respect, respectful, and understanding. But at all times, he endeavored to reveal that the Orthodox Church is the one true Church of Christ. He never wanted that to be confused or the lines blurred or anything, um, as sometimes you know, those kind of discussions do. Nobody wants to, you know, say the tough thing. Um, but he found a way to do it. In 1902, Father Sebastian was sent back to Sitka as the dean of the deanery of Sitka, which he served for two years there. And during this time, he constructed and consecrated a new church in Douglas, which was near Juneau, a small village near, or town near Juneau. But at the end of 1903, he returned to the States, first initially to Chicago, and he visited the community there that he had already previously visited in, years, uh, in previous years, um, the one he had supported and before. And then he went to visit Butte, Montana, which he had also previously visited as well. And in Montana, he encouraged and helped them to build a church, which was completed in 1904 and consecrated in 1905. Under St. Deacon, and his, the vision he had for America, he saw that the ethnic heritage of each Orthodox people should be preserved but um, that everyone should be under, you know, one bishop. His idea was to have various Orthodox missions or kind of uh, um, dioceses um, dedicated to each ethnicity so that they could retain their cultural heritage um, and have the divine services um, you know, in their own form that they're used to, but that they sh everyone should be united under one bishop. That's how, you know, the canons of the church envision a local um, place to be under one bishop. So with this, um, he began... Um, this task by ordaining St. Raphael Brooklyn um, as the vicar bishop of the Syro Arab churches in America. And he had planned to ordain Father Sebastian as the vicar bishop of the Serbian Orthodox churches, but this never came to fruition for a number of reasons. Um, You know, I realized, you know, I said, mentioned St. Raphael, who we're going to talk about next week, but that's not the saint that I mentioned that another one in the future that we're going to talk about. So there's another saint that we're going to hear about that uh, we're still going to look about later. And so, but before they knew that, you know, this plan wasn't going to come to fruition, Father Sebastian moved to Chicago, which was going to be the headquarters of this new um, Serbian um, diocese mission um, that St. Econ had planned. Um, in 1905, they completed and cons consecrated the Holy Resurrection Church in Chicago. Um, and during this time in Chicago, he was also elevated to the rank of Archimandrite, um, 
which is kind of like, you know, means you're the uh, you're the top celibate, you know, priest, the top uh, hierarch monk. Um, it was funny looking. <laughs> they were. Um, he they had a little excerpt of, I don't know if it was a letter he wrote or something about buying the property for this church. And they said they put $1,000 down and they were going to pay the remaining like $6,500 um, with interest. <laughs> no. we, uh, we wish we could pay that little nowadays, huh? <laughs> but in 1907... St. Tikhon was reassigned to the See of Yaroslavl, and he left America with many of his plans unrealized. You know, one of the reasons, and we'll see um, this more as we go on in a few minutes, one of the reasons this plan never came to pass to make uh, Father Sebastian a bishop was that the uh, Serbs were growing um, weary and... Uh, of being under the Russians, and they sort of um, kind of making a fuss. Um, and so they didn't want to have their own kind of Serbian thing under the Russians. They wanted their own, own Serbian thing. Um, you know, what St. Tikhon had done with St. Raphael before he ordained him to the episcopacy, he had him write a letter to Antioch, um, for their blessing to be ordained. And they had to send a letter to the Russian church, you know, they had to send it to you know, either Moscow or St. Petersburg, so that um, the Russian church had to know they was blessed so that they, then St. Tikhon could ordain um, St. Raphael. And so he had asked Father Sebastian to do the same thing. You need the right to the Serbian church in Belgrade to your patriarch, get a blessing for this to happen. Um, but they, at the time, they were unable to help um, with the support that came about with that. So like with helping support some more priests and you know, kind of funding things and they just didn't have the manpower. Um, so that's one of the reasons that these things didn't happen, um, that he never got the blessing from the patriarch. Because uh, St. Tikhon, though he was the bishop over the land, he wanted to be respectful to those ethnicities that he was trying to kind of you know, bring together. So we have, you know, with that also, we have... Uh, The Serbs are trying to get restless of being under the Russians. But the Serbian church themselves don't have the ability to be over the Serbs, you know, in the country. So it's kind of like this no-win situation. And uh, with that, we enter the turbulent times of St. Sebastian's life. It's following St. Tikhon's departure, Archbishop Platon was sent to serve this American diocese. And like we just said, the Serbian church was unable to take care of the Serbs here in America, but the Serbs in America were growing restless, being under, canonically under the Russians. Father Sebastian's only desire in all this was to see that the Serbian people's spiritual needs were taken care of. Um, he didn't care if it was under the Russians or the Serbians himself. But during this time, they were not being taken care of because, you know, people how we are, we uh, make problems where we don't need them to. And uh, this is also one of the uh, times that, you know, people started attacking him um, personally, you know, by the <clears throat> Russians. He was accused of being pro-Serbian and by the Serbians, he was accused of being pro-Russian because he was trying to hold things together. You know, how they had always been. And so not only was there strife in the Serbian communities here in America, 
But in 1912, the Balkan Wars broke out between the Serbs and the Turks. And uh, during this time, he sold what few expensive possessions he had to get money to send to um, help with medical treatments for the fallen or for the um, soldiers who were wounded um, in the war. But he also even went to Serbia and served as an army chaplain for a year. Upon his return to America, he re relocated to the East Coast to teach at the newly founded St. Platon Orthodox Theological Seminary. In 1915, while he was there, he met and became close spiritual <coughs> friends with St. Nikolai Vilimirovich. That's our last saint that he'll be running uh, into. <laughs> so we have... St. Tikon, St. Raphael, St. Nikolai. To add more tension and sorrow to the situation, um, all the chartered Serbian parishes in America elected to leave the Russian church and to place themselves under the Serbian church. And naturally, the Russian church did not agree to it. And it caused a big uproar. Um, and Father Sebastian was treated very poorly by the new Archbishop of the American Diocese after Platon had left. Um, Evdokim was his name. And he was slandered as one of the instigators of the rebellion. But during this troubled time, Father Sebastian still continued with his missionary journeys from coast to coast, still finding those Orthodox who were lived too far from a church. Um, and serving them, ministering to them, much like we'll hear about next week with uh, St. Raphael. In 1917, he asked release from his duties um, from, the, from the Russian church so that he could go serve as chaplain again um, for the Serbian army, but this time during World War I. After World War I, he traveled um, many times back and forth between America and Serbia. Um, while he was here, he continued to minister to the Serbian communities and those Orthodox Christians that he had found that didn't have access to a church. He also made missionary journeys um, to the mission in Japan um, before World War One, before... Um, but also afterwards as well. And that he had met um, Saint uh, Nick Nicholas of Japan um, before he passed away, before he reposed as well, and uh, was uh, learned some missionary things from him, and he tried to teach what he learned to uh, Saint Nicholas. St. Nikolai uh, Velimirovich records that Father Sebastian crossed the Atlantic 15 times and the Pacific nine times. You know, not, not to mention all the times and all the places. And, you know, he went actually in the country and even into Canada, which I didn't even mention that part of his life. Um, he never sat still, as you can see. There's always something to be done. And after he crossed the Atlantic his 15th time, Father Sebastian stayed in Serbia for his retirement. And I want to read to you this account of his final years because I thought it was just so wonderfully written. Um, so this is uh, St. Nikolai's Remembrances. He says, Patriarch Varnava gave him an apartment in the Patriarchate, where he stayed until 1938. Then he moved to Zicha, where he stayed with us for some time, then again to Hersegnovi. On his way to and fro, he was steadily accompanied by the Reverend Jovan Rapovich whom he loved most of all, and who took true filial care of the old man. 
Finally, he returned definitely to, definitively to Zicha, his last resort. He stayed with us until the end of 1940. From there, he wrote many letters to his American friends. In a letter to Mr. Nico Music, he wrote, My body is getting weaker and weaker, and I would like to see once more the Golden Gate. All my dearest memories from childhood are concentrated in San Francisco and in the country in which I was born. I visited him frequently, asking, frequently asking how the brothers served him. His heart was failing, and Father Jovan was with him day and night. The last time on my return to, from the diocese, I went to see him. Sitting in an armchair, he was breathing heavily and spoke in a whisper. Do you have any wish, Father? I asked. Only the kingdom of heaven. He spoke no more. These were his last words. Representative of his entire career on earth. After that, he gave up his spirit. He died on the November 30th, 1940. The next day, he was buried in the monastery cemetery alongside another famous Archimandrite, Father Raphael, formerly the superior of the great Serbian monastery Hilandar on the Holy Mountain, who died in Zicha in 1937. During the night, the season's first snow covered the earth and it was cold. Yet his excellently, excellency, the American ambassador Arthur Bliss Lane, sent the American consul general from Belgrade to represent him at the burial. For Father Sebastian was an American citizen. Besides, Mr. Bliss Lane had great personal devotion to him, calling him my dear spiritual father, or my spiritual father, Dobovich. So ended the earthly pilgrimage of a great servant of Christ and the greatest Serbian missionary of modern times. He was a missionary by words, by deeds, and what is the greatest of all, by his personal character. He was a viceless man, meek and unpretentious. He was positive and constructive in all his words and works. He never engaged in fruitless polemics. Externally, he was a, lean, a little lean man with a beard, just the kind of priest the Serbian immigrants liked, remembering their bearded priests in the old country. And behold, he was American-born and not an immigrant, but his conviction was that an Orthodox priest ought to be recognizable as Orthodox by his exterior too. Archimandrite Sebastian was buried in the cemetery of the Zicha Monastery. At the time of his death, writes Bishop Irene, Father Sebastian owned nothing more than a gold cross, some books, and a few personal mementos. He had long since given away any th significant personal possessions to the poor and needy, choosing for himself a life of poverty, simplicity, and dedicated missionary service. Ten years after Father Sebastian's repose, St. Nikolai wrote of him, Here is a man who indebted all the Serbian race, especially all the Serbs and all the Serbian organizations in America. Should that man remain without a monument or any sign of honor on American soil? He does not need it. He does not wish it. All he wished to his last breath was the kingdom of heaven, which I believe he has obtained by the grace of his Lord. But his people need it. His posterity need it. The Serbian people always cultivated the noble virtue of gratitude. Let them express their traditional gratitude to this remarkable Serbian, Father Sebastian Dobovich. So you heard... Father Sebastian reposed on the feast of the Holy Apostle Andrew. Not surprising since Father Sebastian was a apostle himself. Apostle to these lands, our own lands. Father Sebastian, as you heard also, was buried there in the monastery in Zicha. Where St. Nikolai was. That was in 1940. But in 2007, his relics were exhumed in Zicha, and they were brought to St. Sava Ch Church Cemetery in Jackson to be buried here. And in 2015, he and another Serbian saint of America, who we're not going over, but St. Madari, um, who's also, um, his life is also in this book. They were both glorified and officially entered into the calendar of the saints in 2015. So he's the newest with St. Madari. Um, 
the newest, uh, most recently glorified saint um, of our land here. Um, at their glorification, his relics now are no longer in the cemetery, but they're now in a uh, reliquary in the church. And you can still visit them and venerate them there in the um, St. Sava Church in Jackson. Um, from what we know, he founded nine churches himself. Besides those nine churches he founded, he also served for others at various times in his life. Um, he also contributed to founding um, possibly four more other churches, or maybe even a few more than four, but at least four more other churches. So he had his hand in uh, a lot of uh, the foundings of early Serbian churches, just like St. Raphael had a lot of foundings in early Antiochian churches, especially on the East Coast. You go to this or that church, it's like, oh, yeah, St. Raphael founded this church, you know. Um, but it would be the same thing, you know, with uh, St. Sebastian, if he went to a Serbian church with some of these early Serbian churches. Um, I read, or I, I said, uh, reported to you what the three books that he writ, wrote in English, um, if we're going to look at his writings, which you know, I don't have them to look at. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of what they were um, by their titles. They're fairly straightforward or forward, you know, kind of more catechetical works. Um, so, so since I don't, you know, I'm not going to really dive into his writings or look at them, you know, um, really, in really any more than we already have talked about them. I wanted to read to you one little um, excerpt from a sermon he delivered on Holy Friday. <clears throat> you kind of get a sense, I think, of his own spiritual life, um, how poetic um, he was uh, through this little excerpt. Um, this, remember this sermon for, delivered on Holy Friday. He says, he who prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, has stretched out his arms on the wood in order to embrace a sinful world. But no mortal knoweth how the word was with God and the word was God. The word of God is not bound by death, as a word from the lips dies not entirely away at the moment its sound ceases, but rather gathers new strength, and passing through the senses penetrates the minds and hearts of the hearers. So also the hypostatical word of God, the Son of God, in his saving incarnation, whilst dying in the flesh, fills all things with his spirit and might. Thus, when Christ waxeth faint and becometh silent on the cross, then is it that heaven and earth raise their voice to him, and the dead preach the resurrection of the crucified, and the very stones cry out. You see how you know, poetic and penetrating his words are from this brief little short excerpt of a sermon. There's also, um, at the end of this book, uh, a couple of sermons from him and uh, a couple of short, um, like kind of article kind of things. One is called The Condition of Society. The other is called Sincere Religion. This one, uh, the condition of society, um, he talks about um, the rise and the new trends of society that indicate an apostasy, apostasy from traditional Christian way of life. He talks about the craze after unwholesome fashions the nervous, unsteady rush to keep up with the times in which parents are in such a hurry and so empty inside that they deprive their children of a stable, secure Christian home. 
the exaltation of shamelessness among young women, and the disdain of the virtues of modesty and purity, the disrespect of young men toward their elders, the rising number of young people who wish to remain unmarried, and of married people who do not wish to have children so that they can have as much pleasure as possible. He says, in view of all this, the preacher of the word of God is obliged by a terrible oath he has given before he received the gift of apostolic succession at his ordination to present to you the whole of the truth, not part of it. Quite uh, prophetic uh, with a lot of those things he said. And how uh, he saw things back then or much more progress down the road nowadays. So with that, I'll end. St. Sebastian, I mean, on a personal note, you know, every week going through these saints and their lives is like a slap in the face, you know. Um, wondering, you know, why I'm such a loser, you know. Of course, you know, these, none of these people had, you know, families and, things like this, but she's, uh, they're really dedicated and uh, gave their entire lives to God and to uh, bringing him and his church to the people, whether they're Orthodox or not. It's just really inspiring and kind of, uh, you know, condemning at the same time in my own life I feel like um, but you know by their prayers you know maybe we'll be able to do a little bit more so I hope they're inspiring to you um, seeing kind of the wilderness and the frontierness of early orthodoxy Americans see what many of these um, saints had to go through in their dedication Okay, I'm done. Are there any questions?